He's had the unique uh, uh, um, honor of being chief at UC Irvine three different times during his career. There are a few people that can say they've been in the church. But today, the reason we brought John here, not only because he's part of the family, is because one thing that we do not give the faculty and the residents, this is not just what education on the changing field of neurosurgery from the financial and economic end. And I'm going to tell you, we're running a search for the chair of the Department of Surgery. And you better know your stuff if you think that you're going to be a professor somewhere or a chair somewhere. Because one of the most important questions we ask is, what are you going to do when MACRA comes? What are you, what's an ACO? You know, all those things. So I thought, and we have and Doug Smith from Professor of Orthopedic Surgery is here sitting in the background. And that give, gives you testimony to how important this stuff is. So without further ado, I'm going to ask John Kuski to tell us what's coming down the pipe. And by the way, it is great to see you. I didn't see how you said, does everybody remember this gentleman with the beard, the sailor with the beard that just no. came? Let's give him a hand. Welcome back. Great to see you. Are you covering next month? <laughs> this month. <laughs> you know, recovering. Well, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, somewhat of a <clears throat> somber talk. It's uh, not fun and games. But, uh, I'm going to point out several things that probably you haven't heard very much about or thought very much about. <clears throat> I gave a talk here about uh, five years ago on the state of U.S. health care, and uh, it's changed considerably uh, since that time. I'm going to point out some references, too, that I would like you to be cognizant of because they give an idea of how things are changing. One of these uh, reprints comes from uh, the Harvard Business Review, and uh, this is written by a person whose name is Michael Porter, who is a uh, professor there. And uh, you can read what he has to say, but uh, we are standing at a crossroads in terms of finance, and we are standing at the end of an era of fee-for-service, and uh, even though fee-for-service still is the major way people get paid in this country, uh, the stress is on to get rid of that kind of healthcare delivery system. In that same journal, uh, Harvard Business Review, and I have the reference for both of them in this talk, and I'd like you, hopefully, to be able to read those sometimes, those two articles, are pretty easy to read. Is this other article which has to do with another way to pay doctors. And the key to these two articles is, is that the first one has to do with bundling payments and prepaying physicians for episodes of care bundles. And the second article has to do with capitation, where a fixed <coughs> sum of money is given to a group to pay for all the health care that comes forward in, in that year. And personally, I've lived through capitation, and it's, uh, it's a difficult situation sometimes. And you, they talk about full risk for people who are capitated. In California in the 90s, we were fully capitated, and we were paid 50 cents per member per month to take care of about 110,000 neurosurgery, uh, 10, 110,000 people. So <clears throat> we had to figure out how we were going to survive 50 cents a month for 110. 10,000 people, and we did, but uh, that's another issue that's out there, and that's what this article is about, mentioning the two ways that at least our government is thinking about paying all of you in the future, either by bundling or by capitation. <clears throat> now, something that most people don't think about, don't care about, is this number. This is for 2013, and this is the last number I have that actually is officially accepted. And the total tax funded expenditure <coughs> in the United States for health care in 2013 was one trillion eight hundred and seventy seven billion dollars. One trillion eight hundred and seventy seven one trillion eight hundred and seventy seven billion. And uh, that is the amount of money that the government spent on health care. That number is <clears throat> increasing 
and it projects it to increase to about 3.6 trillion by 2024, when a lot of you are going to be out there <clears throat> in practice. So the government's overall uh, responsibility for health care in 2013, they were paying for 64% of all the health care delivered in the United States. And that expenditure is larger than the that, is, that share of the GDP, which was 11.2% in 2013, is greater than the total expenditure in any other nation for health care. Now, 72 million Americans now are in Medicaid programs or CHIP programs in the United States. And in 2015, the total Medicare spending was of $509 billion. Uh, almost two-thirds of that was paid by the federal government and the rest was paid by the states. Medicaid accounts now for one in six dollars spent in the healthcare system. But there's some things that dog that program. One is that 50% of the money, 50% of long-term care spending is paid for by Medicaid throughout the United States and 9% of prescription, prescription drug costs come out of Medicaid. So how did that happen? Well, two things happened. There was a great recession, and that led to many people having less income and being less able to afford health care premiums. And the second thing was the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. And some people would say that the Affordable Care Act is the enablement of Medica Medicaid Act. But anyway, Affordable Care Act uh, gave the privilege for low-income people of being insured by Medicaid. And we all know that Medicaid is a program which pays everybody much less than any other program. And so the insurance for these people is Medicaid throughout the United States. And that has changed another aspect of how things get done. So we know that 32 states have now adapt, adopted Medicaid. And uh, we know that a couple more started in 2016 and one in 2017. And uh, the initial growth in Medicaid spending obviously was quite high when all these people joined up. It's now slowed down some. Now, I really don't like showing slides like this, but it's the only way to get all this together. Traditionally, the government says, this is what we spend every year. And they say that with, they, I'm talking now about federal and state governments together. The governments say they spend about 46%, they support about 46% of health care in the United States. And that's what these numbers are here. These are the direct expenditures by government for Medicare, for the CHIP program, and for Medicaid, and all other programs. But they also pay the premiums for all the employees in the federal government, which is $32 billion a year. <coughs> the state or local governments pay $156 billion a year for uh, premiums for their employees. And then there's the subsidy for employer paid health care. Now that costs the government a lot of money. Now all of us enjoy that, we have enjoyed that, because when you get your health care, it costs X amount of dollars per month to provide it. That is not charged to you as income. So that means, and, it's, and it is deductible for the employer. So that means the federal government is losing, is not getting at least $249 billion in revenue and the state governments are not getting $45 billion in that. So the total tax finance expenditures are $1.87 trillion, which I just talked about, and that's 64.3% of the national health total expenditure in 2013. And those numbers, as we go forward, are just going up, but the same kind of ratios. You've probably seen this kind of a slide before, but the uh, United States 
11.2% of healthcare co uh, the healthcare <coughs> costs uh, amount to 11.2% of the GDP in 2013. And they can compare that to all the other countries in this list. And you can see where the, by far, the highest percentage contribution to the GDP of any country in the, in the developed world. So, out of this article, which is published in the American Journal of Public Health, which is probably a journal that most of you don't pick up every day and read, uh, I can understand that, uh, uh, they point out that even though it's a perception that the government pays less than half the total health care costs in the United States, the actual number is, is about two-thirds and getting higher. So we have to consider that. We already have a system where the government is paying almost two-thirds of the health care costs in the United States. Think about what that means. Now, in addition to that, we have this problem. So the cost for an average family of four for a PPO, employer-based insurance in the United States, in 2015 was, uh, 2016 is about $25,000. And the total cost to the employee is about $11,000 in that plan. And that's increased 5.3% since 2015 and the employer's cost has gone up 4.2%. So it's very difficult for people to afford insurance, even in the private market. Keep that in mind as you're dealing with all these folks. Now, we know that healthcare <coughs> insurance is an important part of everybody's family. I mean, it's clearly necessary, but as we know that, we also know it's getting to be less affordable to everybody. And, and prescription drugs are by far the fastest growing component of those costs. And that's something else we're going to have to deal with. In, 20, in 2001, early in this century, employers paid about 61% of the cost of that insurance, and the employees paid about 39%. And in 2016, that split is 57 and 43. And the rate of increase in this Milliman Medical Index, Milliman, by the way, is an actuarial firm that looks at the cost of health insurance and projects future costs. This MMI increase is well above the consumer price index increase for medical, for medical services. So, that surpasses the average 2% increase in median household income between 2004 and 2014. So the cost of health care for people out there is going up much faster than their incomes are. So from the Pacific Business Group on Health, and the, by the way, the Boeing Company is a member of the Pacific Business Group on Health, this quote from the president of that organization, there's an understanding that if we don't get a handle on spending at some point, we will have a government finance system and we will look to taxpayers to figure out how to cap total health care costs. Most employers don't want to see that happen. Well, I've just pointed out to you that the government already spends, uh, covers most of the cost of health care for all of us. So this statement, <clears throat> while true, is a little bit behind the curve. Now, what about the ACA right now? Interesting problems. From the right, criticism. <clears throat> I don't want any plan that has a spiraling premiums, you know, reduced access to docs, <laughs> high deductibles, uh, and uh, federal subsidies and related tax hikes. <coughs> From the left, they also agree that <clears throat> the ACA has got problems. Uh, insurance is not as good as private insurance. Uh, <clears throat> there's higher outlays for cost of medicine, and there's limited doctor networks throughout the country that those folks can deal with. So what is wrong, basically, with the ACA right now? Well, the biggest problem is that 
<clears throat> fewer people have signed up for the Affordable Care Act and to be members of the exchanges <clears throat> than was projected. And the ones that have signed up are sicker and more expensive than projected. So we have less people signing up and they cost more money because they're sicker than people thought they would be. So adverse selection was filtered out of plans. Adverse selection meaning that if you had a pre-existing condition uh, in the past, the insurance company wouldn't, wouldn't insure you. That's been filtered out now so that that doesn't count anymore. So if you have diabetes, congestive heart failure, or whatever, uh, they can't exclude you from the insurance policy. Well, obviously, those people are sicker, they take more money, and uh, before they couldn't get insurance. So, to afford all that, <clears throat> you need as large a risk pool, pool as possible. And so, one of the thoughts was for this act was that there would be lots of young people who would enroll themselves in the plan, but they haven't. So, CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, which you get, to, you need to get to know better and read their publications because they really do tell you what it's like out there. <coughs> the CBO projected about 24 million enrollees by this year, and the reality is that less than half of those that number signed up. Uh, first of all, why did that happen? Well, number one, because employers. It was thought that, well, when we get this started, the employers are going to bail on health insurance and they're not going to pay for it anymore. Well, that's not happening. The enrollment rate in employer-sponsored health insurance has remained about the same as it was before the Affordable Care Act was passed. And then there was Mr. Obama's words that if you like your health plan, health care plan, you can keep it. Well, he said that, and then in 2013, Many millions of us were notified that our health plans were being canceled because they didn't meet the statutory requirements of the Affordable Care Act. And that was rescinded until 2017, and less pro people entered the program, even though that they were able to keep the grandfather their policies in place. So a healthy risk pool needs young people. And because they don't sign up, number one, because they think they're young and they're invincible and they're never going to get sick and they don't really care. That's one thing. And they find that they can actually, if they don't sign up, they'll save money. Even the fine that's levied because they don't sign up is much cheaper than buying the insurance and all the co-pays and deductibles that go with it. It's been projected by CBO that at least 35% of those people in that age group should be in this program, and the trouble is that less than about 28% actually are. <clears throat> There's one other issue here, and that is that for people who are up to the age of 26 can stay on their parents' insurance policy. So that costs more money for the insurance companies too. But that also limits the number of young people who enroll. Why should they enroll if they're a they mom and dad's policy? They're still covered by that, and the answer is they don't. So that's another issue which wasn't really thought about when this law was passed. There's another problem with enrollment timing. There's supposed to be a single time of the year which starts now when people can enroll in these government-sponsored health plans. And they're only supposed to sign up now, but there have been many exceptions. For example, let's say you don't sign up and then you get sick and you learn you have to have some expense or something or else done to your done. So people sign up for that, and then after they're done with their health care, they cancel their policies. Well, <clears throat> it's been shown that those people that sign up like that, they cost the insurance companies at least 30% more than the average person who signs up for the <coughs> It's not totally unex unexplained. Also, keep in mind that this law wasn't aimed at just taking care of us, but it was also written to consider the well-being of the insurance companies. And the Affordable Care Act included some I'd say protection against uh, basically 
spending too much money and going broke. And uh, these were insurance things that helped these companies along. The three topics that you need to be aware of that support insurance providers. There's reinsurance, and reinsurance is a cash flow that goes to each insurance company to help them cover the cost of the, of the, of the insurance they have to provide if their premiums don't cover it. And in the first two years of the program, uh, $15 billion went to the providers of insurance. There's a risk adjustment issue, which is by far one of the most complex things that we, they deal with. And I think you probably all would agree with me that our ability to risk adjust is very primitive at best, and so that remains a problem. And in other words, putting it basically is the people who sign up in my plan are sicker than the people who sign up in your plan. Well, how do we, how do we assess that in, in a satisfactory numerical way? And then finally, there are what are called risk quarters. And that's where the problem is right now. The amount of money that goes into risk quarters would go to those companies, to those plans, where they had to spend more money than they planned to and lost money providing care. And the perfect example of companies that have failed because of risk quarter problems are the co-ops throughout the United States, and most of them have failed, have gone broke. Now, how did that happen? Well, in the first year or so of the plan, the risk quarters were, were paid for by the government. And by the way, these programs are, were are sunsetting now anyway. They were paid for by the government. And there was, in 2014, in Congress, uh, a law, a amendment to a statute that was put in place by, guess who, Senator Rubio. Senator Rubio said, hey, listen, we don't want to pay, we don't want to bail out these insurance companies. We don't want to pay this money for these risk orders. So the amount of money that was going to be paid that they thought the, the insurance companies thought they were going to get, they didn't get. Instead of getting about $2.8 billion to cover risk for, to cover its losses, they got $412 million. So a lot of them went broke because of that issue. So they filed these claims for $2.9 billion, that's what it was, and then they got this $400 million. And so basically what they have is they received 12.6 cents on the dollar for what they were thought they were going to get. And so, as this slide points out, many of these co-op plans went out of business. They blamed their collapse in part because they didn't receive the payment they expected. So what's happening now, and you're all aware of this, is that health care premiums are going really off the chart. And uh, I brought, and somewhere here, there is a sheet that I brought that tells you what the increases in Washington State are going to be for this year. And uh, they're pretty hefty. And they range anywhere from a low of about 8.9% to a high of about 28%. So there are many people in the state are going to be paying a lot more for health insurance, particularly in the individual market. So. Either they get their premiums raised or they leave the markets altogether. And we know that's happening too. And so for the ACA law and for those people that get insurance through the ACA, by the way, who are the low income people in the United States, throughout the United States there are more and more places where the large insurance companies, United Health, Aetna, Cigna, Humana, have all withdrawn from the market. And so there are places in the United States now where there is only one provider for health care. And in some counties, uh, there's nobody to provide health care. And Arizona is probably the worst example of a state that has very few providers uh, giving uh, available for these people to buy policies through. So how do you get make this better? Well, you can enroll when you get sick. You should, there should be a tighter enrollment rules. It's been proposed that a public plan be offered so that people who are under 65 can buy into the Medicare program. 
And uh, not only has that been proposed by Mr. Obama, but uh, Hillary has, Ms. Clinton has proposed a similar plan for people 55 and older buying into Medicare. And I'll leave that to your imagination what that means in terms of how healthcare is provided. Uh, there are some other fixes that people <coughs> probably won't go for, and a lot of them would cha require changes in the law, which given the hyperpolarization of our Congress right now, is unlikely to happen at any time in the near future. So one of the things would be stop allowing people who under or 26 or under staying on their on their parents health care policy well you can bet that Congress is not going to support that that'll never happen increasing the financial power coverage for those who don't get coverage remember there's an individual mandate everybody's supposed to get insurance and if they don't they get fined and nobody wants to increase that fine because that's a very unpopular that's the most unpopular thing about the ACA anyway is the mandate and then there's one about old guys, uh, not quite as old as I am, that allows the exchange insurers to charge more to older customers. That's part of what's called community rating. So community rating now for the law is that, and we already talked about this, that if you have a certain condition, you can get insurance without being, without being penalized. In the law, they're allowed to charge older people three three times as much as they do younger people for insurance, because obviously older people require more health care. And uh, they are proposing that that rate will be increased to about six or seven to one, which basically is what the uh, health insurance companies charged older people before the ACA uh, came along. That's unlikely to happen either. And then there's I thought about making the plans more flexible so that more people can afford them. So what's probably the easiest fix of all is just to make good on the promise of paying for the risk orders. This 2.5 billion would go a long way to uh, wiping out some of their losses. But, but, repeal and replace is the mantra of the Congress, particularly the Republicans. So depending on the political atmosphere after November 8th, this may still be an issue or may not be, but as long as it's an issue, uh, nothing will get done substantially to improve or change the law. So that's where we're at with that. So 20 million Americans, one of the good things about the ACA is that 20 million Americans who didn't have health insurance before got it. But a lot of them are in Medicaid, and personally, I think Medicaid is like better than nothing, but not great. Some people say you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube because it's got there too been out there too long, and it, we can't change things. Well, I'm not sure that's right. Congress, if this is to succeed as it is, will need to get together on a bipartisan basis and improve the law. Mm -hmm. Are you offering odds on that? <laughs> uh, well, I, if you bet for that, I'd give you about 100 to 1 odds that won't happen. <laughs> uh, so the political process doesn't lend itself to rationally solving these problems. But in this campaign that's gone on, the candidates have not said a word, at least I've never heard say anything about what the major problem here is, and that's our debt. And our debt, not true. Not national true. Not debt. True. Not true, not true, not true. What? Not true, as a, as a portion of GDP. It is well within the range well, of other, other Let me finish here. Countries. Yeah, the debt right now is a little bit greater than 19 trillion, which is about 70% of GDP right now. And that's true. And China, for example, has a debt that's about 240% of GDP right now. However, as things go along, and that's not what our total debt is going to remain, the CDO projected over the next 30 years that our bubble, our, our debt will be about 103 trillion. 
<clears throat> so that is, for some people anyway, an unsustainable level of debt. That $103 trillion that they've talked about, Social Security accounts for about $14 trillion of that. Medicare accounts for about $34 trillion of that. And the interest accounts for about $55 trillion. So obviously we need to look at ways to improve Social Security delivery and Medicare. Social Security is pretty easy to fix. Medicare is a different problem. So George, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the future and how we're going to deal with it. It depends on how fast the economy grows. So well, a portion of the economy is the important thing. Let me go on here. Uh, you'd think from all this discussion that health, I mean, we live or die with whatever happens to the Affordable Care Act. Well, that's not true. And uh, one side says almost nothing apart from saying Obamacare must somehow be abandoned. And the other side states that health costs, partly because of Obamacare, might be under control. But neither side faces up to the fact that the dominance of health costs in projecting future federal spending. Healthcare spending comprises the majority of all projected increases in non-interest outlays from the federal government through 2026. But Obamacare, for people under 65, is so really a small amount of that cost, actually, not a major cost. So, from an article in Health Affairs, and by the way, as we go along here, Health Affairs is a journal that all of you should become familiar with because it is the leading journal in the United States for the <coughs> depiction of healthcare policy. An article, recent article in Health, health Affairs, the annual health care spending in the United States for 2015 to 25, the average growth per year is about is expected to be about 5.8%. And that's about a 1.3% faster than the growth in the GDP and will represent about 20% of the economy in 2025, according to these projections. And so growth in healthcare spending, as George pointed out, may be related to changes in economic growth, faster growth in medical prices, or and or population aging. Well, we know medical prices are going to go up because of all the new technical aspects of things. And I'm talking now technology, including all the new drugs, which do miraculous things, but cost $100,000 for, you know, a dose. So that's an issue. So since 1980, the, the growth in national health expenditures has averaged about 7.8% or GDP plus 2.2 until the onset of the 2008 recession when that growth has slowed considerably. Now why that growth slowed the terms of growth in the cost of health care isn't clear. Because the growth in the, in the slowing in the growth of health care occurred before the Great Recession. It may have something to do with the recession. Some of Obama's supporters say that it is because of the Obamacare, uh, Obamacare well, I've already pointed out that's not a significant part of the total picture. So it's really unclear why people are using less services, they may be buying less health care. But anyway, the growth is slow. 5.8% is, is better than it ever was before. Now, some people say that the economists should pay more attention to the share of growth in real per capita personal income that goes into health care spending. Think about this for a minute. Between 1980 and 2007, health spending absorbed 25% of our income growth. So for every year that your income went up, 25% of that money was taken away on average by increased health care costs. Based on projections that are now available, health care spending will account for 42% of our income growth between 2007 and 2025. That means that any income growth that we all enjoy will be reduced by 42% by because of the cost of health care. So what are we going to do? Well, one, one depiction is 
we can do what's on this slide. We can raise taxes by 4%, <coughs> cut spending on defense and other non-health care costs by 35%. And you can see what it says. We can raise taxes. We can cut spending on, on other things to maintain the level of health care in, in 2035 that we have now. This is one economist's projection of what's going to need to be done. Now, <clears throat> for guys like me, uh, this is not a problem because I won't be around in that time, but all of you, all of you out here, most of you, will be. So that's why this is important for you all to think about now. <clears throat> okay, so anyway, recessions are stated to lower GDP growth much more than lower health care, and then they lower health care spending, and so uh, even that is not something that really helps us out very much. CBO, this is a cover of the recent CBO publication, July of this year, on the long-term outlook for the budget and health care. Uh, and uh, this is the slide that shows what's going to happen between now and 2026. Medicare is going to increase by 24% in terms of outlays and uh, Medicaid another 12%. And so the major health programs will increase the deficit by 26%, Social Security by 29%, and the interest by 24%, and all other programs 12%. So that's where we're at. So here's, here's a slide which simply shows what the CBO projects for debt uh, in the United States out to the year 2040, and by that time it will be about 140% of GDP. So as George points out, there are countries right now that have higher debt ratios and that, but it's still something that needs to be accounted for because of all the interest. And you might say, well, you know, maybe the Federal Reserve is helping us out right now because the interest rates are so low. If the interest rates go up, then it's going to cost the, more money, the government even now more money to pay for that debt. Well, I'm going to not spend much time on this. <laughs> and I, there's several slides here. <coughs> I'll just say this. But as far as this, uh, what these folks have proposed, uh, Hillary, Ms. Clinton, has proposed basically sticking with the ACA, improving it, and uh, she's get, she has a fairly detailed program of how she wants to do that. Uh, Mr. Trump has a much less detailed program. He does want to abolish the ACA. Question comes up, if you abolish the ACA, then what? There are 20 million people that have insurance now. There's 30 million that still don't have it, but 20 million that do. What are we going to do about them? Uh, and he has several other issues that come up. But this is all on these slides, and it probably be worth your time looking at them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go, I'm going to skip several, several slides here, and I want to go to macro. <coughs> So let me just go through all this, if you don't mind. You can look at these later on your leisure. Okay, let's just get down here to where the action is. Now, several years ago, Ronald Reagan said when he was president, these are his words, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. Well, he said that those are the nine most terrifying words in the English language. I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. So I want to ask you guys a question. Can anybody in this room tell me what MACRA is all about? Do you know what MACRA is? Anybody? Anybody? Boy, it's pretty quiet in here. <laughs> MACRA. <coughs> okay, MACRA is the Medicare Access and Chip Reauthorization Act of 2015. And MACRA replaced the flawed sustainable growth rate formula. When I was here in 2011, we talked about the sustainable growth rate formula. And we talked about how every year there was going to be a major, major cut in what doctors get <coughs> paid. And in 2015, for example, there was going to be a 21% cut. And that was, this came from 2014 from the Washington Committee and Neurosurgery. Well, it never happened, never, ever happened. But in 2015, MACRA was passed. It did away with the SDR, 
and it set up a program for how doctors are going to be paid in the future and what they have to do to get the money. So that's what we're going to talk about a little bit. MACRA is a very complicated law. The statute itself is about 97 pages long. The, the recent uh, release of regulations that cover it are about 2,900 pages. That's a daunting size regulation. The complex law will affect physicians in a wide variety of ways for many years to come. That's all of you out here that are young. It covers such issues as data reporting, practice models, clinical standards, physician evaluations, and it involves hundreds of millions of dollars in penalties and bonuses. So that's the overview. Here are just a few of the acronyms that you'll have to now keep in mind that relate to MACRA. And the, I mean, you can't break this stuff down without having all these uh, uh, this alphabet soup to try to understand it, because the words, uh, it's impossible to remember all those words. So, the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act of 2015, which is commonly known as MACRA, was approved on a bipartisan basis by Congress and signed into law by the President in April last year, 2015. And at the time it passed, there was great celebration out there by all the medical groups in the United States, all the major organizations, wonderful, we got rid of the SPR, and that's great. Okay. Well, so, it was perceived that getting rid of the SGR and this threat of this cut in cost, I mean, payments to doctors every year was really wonderful. But after people began to realize a little bit more about what they were dealing with, uh, they didn't like the idea. These two people who you probably know who they are, one, uh, John Boehner was the Speaker of the House and Nancy Pelosi was the minority leader at that time, they got together, believe it or not. They didn't cohabitate, but they did uh, agree to uh, uh, pass this law. And they agreed not to seek other ways to pay for the cut in the SGR, which cost them uh, several billion dollars. So that's, that's how it all happened. And there was a bipartisan vote that approved this. One of the few bipartisan votes that's ever happened in the recent Congress. So the goal of this thing, according to Medicare, sustain, got rid of the SGR. So it's supposed to improve care for medical beneficiaries and change the payment physician system to one focused on, not focused on volume, to one focused on value. Here's the lady who leads uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, Secretary Burwell, and here's her acting administrator, Mr. Slavitt. So Mr. Slavitt and Secretary Burwell are the ones who lead the charge on this. And they're the ones who, who I wouldn't say authored, but who have approved these regulations that I've just talked about. The primary goal of this law is to move away from fee-for-service reimbursement towards a value-based payment system. That's what it's all about. An editorial from the Wall Street Journal, unfortunately the law empowers the federal bureaucracy <coughs> at the expense of the doctor-patient relationship. This new set of rules uses the power of Medicare to put the federal government in charge of almost every aspect of physician care in the U.S. So, for your information, there's a statute that's passed, and the statute outlines what the law is all about. And the statute, in this case, as I pointed out, is uh, 95 or 97 pages long. I've got it on one of my computers, but who cares? But the final macro rule came out just on October 14th. There was a preliminary rule for comments they came out earlier in the year, and there were thousands of comments regarding this law. The <coughs> rule is under in will be published in the Federal Register in a couple of days from now, uh, and it will take up a lot of space in the Federal Register. 
It's entitled the Medicare Program Merit-Based Incentive Payment System MIPS, an alternative payment model, 8 p.m. incentive under the physician fee schedule and criteria for physician-focused payment models. So it's coming out very shortly. It's out. It's official now. It becomes effective January 1st. Okay. So here's a few comments. Sweeping changes for Medicare physician reimbursement are in store as federal officials look to ease eligible clinicians into the new outcomes-based program. <coughs> the rule finalizes parameters of the merit-based system, MIPS, MIPS, remember MIPS, and the advanced alternative payment models, the APMs. Collectively, these are referred to as the Quality Payment Program, the QPP. So we have MIPS, and we have APM, and we have QPP. <laughs> the most, I read a lot of this stuff, and uh, so I, mean, I, go to, I go to great lengths to get these sources. The most fundamental problem with the rule is, is, is its insane complexity. <laughs> and I brought with me, I don't have it with me in this, at this moment, but I have the executive summary from CMS about the rule. The executive summary is about 25 or 30 pages long. Now I've read lots of I've read lots of legislation now in the last several years, and I've read you know summaries from the <coughs> CMS. And I tell you, I read that thing, and it was only 20 few pages long, and versus the rule, which is almost 3,000 pages long, and I really had a hard time understanding it. Even I'm not sure I do now. The complexity of it is a function of both the complexity of what we do and the impossibility of what Congress has asked CMS to do. And what they ask them to do is to measure the cost and quality of physician services at both the individual and group level. To punish and reward doctors based on <coughs> inaccurate scores and to oversee the creation of vaguely defined and unproven enemies like entities like ACOs and medical homes, which will also dish out penalties and rewards based on inaccurate data. So, the present, this new law replaces the PQRS, the Physician Quality Reporting System, which we now live under, the value-based payment modifier, which causes more or less money depending on whether we do report this to the PQRS, to the, to the CMS, and the Meaningful Use Program for Electronic Health Records. And it will also have a new category on clinical practice improvement activities. So what happens now, not much, 2015 to 2019 Medicare physicians will receive a 0.5% annual update. 0.5%, boy, that's a big deal. <clears throat> I mean, you know, inflation is even higher than that right now. From 20 to 25, the payment update will be zero. Starting in 2026, the update for APM providers will be about three quarters of a percent per year. For those not participating, the update will be a quarter of a percent. Between 20 and 2015 and 19, all current Medicare incentive and payment programs remain in place. It provides a new framework for rewarding health doc for providing rewarding health care providers for giving better care, not just more care. So I want to ask you a question right now. So as neurosurgeon, starting with craniotomies of all kinds, I mean how many craniotomies are done that are superfluous? Very few, I think. Very few. Now, where we might get into trouble is with spine surgery. And there might be spine surgeries that are done from time to time that are maybe not necessary. <laughs> but nevertheless, that's all out there and that will be looked at. So the quality payment program includes the merit-based incentive payment system, MEPS, remember these words, the advanced alternative payment models, APMs, and most neurosurgeons will be in MEPS. And all the MIPS eligible docs include docs, uh, DOs, PAs, MPs, a bunch of people. 
first year Medicare Part B participation, the people in the first year don't have to participate. And uh, in the final rule, there's a, a low patient threshold if you have Medicare billing charges less than or equal to $30,000 or provide care for 100 or fewer Medicare patients in one year, you don't have to participate in the system. And then, and then there are participants in APMs that don't have to participate in the system either. So I've already mentioned this $30,000 or 100 patients. And this new policy, by the way, will exclude about 380,000 doctors. This is a very interesting paper. It came from the Mac, came from the Brookings Institution, and it's Macra Final Rule Hyper Hope. <coughs> In the area of evidence-based policy making, data and facts should trump opinions and gut feelings. It is appalling that an agency such as CMS, which should be spearheading evidence-based rulemaking, is insisting on either failed policies or untested ones that are destined to fail. That's their comment. If you read this thing, you're going to say, you're going to find phrases like, we believe that, we are convinced that. Those are not scientific statements. Those are like marketing statements. And so a lot of these things that they're proposing, like ACOs, like medical homes, like bundled payments, like capitation, are not necessarily been proven to work. In fact, ACOs, there have been no evidence, really, that there's been a significant direct reduction in cost. So this is, this is a little bit wishy-washy right now. So that's where we're at. Uh, I would like to point out to you one of the slides I didn't cover was about America's Bitter Pill, the book. And in that book, there's a, there's a statement about negotiations that occurred in Congress in 2003 when the Congress voted so that Medicare could not negotiate with, health, uh, with pharmaceutical companies for the cost of drugs based on, uh, they couldn't negotiate like the VA does, like the DOD does, and they had to give them whatever they thought was 106% of their cost, wholesale cost, to produce these drugs. Well, that's cost the taxpayers now about $40 billion a year. But the point is, every one of you in this room, every one of you should read this book by Stephen Brill, America's Bitter Pill, Money, Politics, Backroom Deals, and the Fight to Fix Our Broken Healthcare System. And that was published in 2015. And if you don't read anything else, read that, because it's a, it's a significant uh, issue. I've given these slides and more to Christina, and the reference, there are a lot of references in there if you're interested in reading more about this. And uh, uh, maybe we can put together some kind of a course or something that will give you more insights into macro so that you can begin to work with this a little bit easier. You know, I'm, I have to deal with most of these issues, macro, micro. It comes up all the time in our university and elsewhere, and I just got schooled. This was a terrific talk. It was apolitical, it was just the facts, it was pretty amazing, John. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. So, questions for him? All right, Lewis, then Shay, and the residents, I want to see you ask questions. This is your future. Undead and gone by the time this happens. <laughs> thank, thank you for a great presentation. I think it goes without saying to the audience that you know all of this is just to me a, a really thinly uh, disguised uh, veil of ways to save costs and pay less to providers and hospitals and so forth. But uh, Harborview surprised me as the beneficiary of these types of uh, quality based payments because one, we never used to get payment at all for a lot of these patients. Two, we take incredible, we go to incredible lengths to play the game set up the systems that are required that are incredibly expensive infrastructure and time consuming and resource uh, consuming. But um, but we do it. 
and we get these long payments, you know, every quarter that are meaningful use based or all the you know the macro macro uh, criteria. And, uh, and what I'm getting at is, are, there are going to be winners and losers in every system, and, and who are going to be the winners and losers? In the well. The early criticism that comes uh, primarily from the small practices and, and the individual practitioners because of all the data requirements that this thing involved and all the data that has to be collected, which will be difficult. I would make a guess that an institution like the University of Washington will put together or has put together a, a way to provide most of this information to CMS. Now, whether CMS and that will be cost a lot of money to do all that, but I'm sure they can do that. So I think the bigger group practices will do okay with MACRA, even though these measures are probably meaningless or weak at best, because there's no evidence that anything I've talked about today so far has reduced <coughs> costs or made, or made people healthier. Not a single iota of evidence. There's no evidence that the ACA has made people happier or better. I mean, they're happier because they got insurance, but are they, is their health better? There's no evidence for that. So I think that I think that bigger practices will do well. If I were in a two-man neurosurgical group somewhere, I might find this a little more difficult to deal with. First of all, because of the electronic records that have to be kept, and because of all this all this stuff that has to be provided. Now, one of the things I did mention was that macro starting next year will allow uh, physicians to form a virtual group. So a virtual group could, could uh, address some of these issues because let's say there's 50 neurosurgeons or what, I don't know, whatever. A group of neurosurgeons wants to get together as a virtual group and present this data as a group that might help uh, and then it would probably be less expensive per doctor. So that's a coming up, and that's next year. There's some, I mean, basically, uh, Mr. Slavitt is going out of his way to come on in, docs, let's, let's join the party here, and doing everything he can to make a difficult, hard to understand, cumbersome rule more palatable to doctors. And the question remains whether in the future doctors will actually hang in with this or not, and that's still to be decided. A survey, there are surveys out there, at least 30% of the doctors in the United States have no idea what MACRA is at all. Another 25% have said, yeah, well, I've heard of MACRA, but I don't know anything about it. What about MIPS? I don't know what that's all about. I don't know what APMs are all about. So a lot of doctors don't even know anything about this at all. So at least we've started the ball rolling here a little bit, and uh, you're now at least know it's out there. You saw it with zero percent of this room shape. Last question. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a comment, actually. That, um, you know, neither political party is really aware of it, or maybe they're aware they're not pressing it. There is a, a revolution that is taking place uh, quietly, but it will gain rapidly, gain momentum in the next 10 years. And that will be the fact of artificial intelligence robotics, which is going to replace, or at least certainly, uh, largely to face a lot of manufacturing jobs, uh, you will bring back most of the manufacturing that's been out for outsourced into various countries, and the need for a lot of the low-paying engineering-related jobs will vanish. Uh, but the corollary of that is that a lot of less educated and less prepared folks will lose their jobs. Uh, and the impact of this is, is going to be much, much bigger than anyone has imagined. And neither party is uh, prepared for this. Uh, essentially, you can imagine that even in healthcare, probably one half of the jobs will be replaced. And uh, so we'll be left with uh, ensuring a population that is perhaps you know, not able to deal with these changes. Uh, so the, the safety net has to be really big in order to protect the, the humans. Um, and you know so what that eventually does? we're going to get to a maybe a single payer or a hybrid system. Like I think that's the been, bottom one. Yeah. We're going to be a single payer system. Well, we're, we already are. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Our hybrid system like that in Germany. You so want let, me just, let me just point out one more thing to you here. I'm sorry to do, but in Europe, 
There are many countries where fee-for-service is not a bad word. And there, if you go to Switzerland, for example, I mean, they're paid on a fee-for-service basis. How do they control costs? By limiting what the doctors can charge. So they let them play fee-for-service, but they, they limit what they can charge. In the United States, we don't do that, and therefore, that's part of our problem, too. And as far as people losing their jobs, I mean, well, that's part of the problem already. I mean, a million of people are underemployed or not employed because of their jobs that they've lost. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. We are present conference.